Welcome, everybody, from the Great Northern Plains region. We're so excited to have you again on another beautiful fall day, at least it is here in Colorado. Um, wherever you are, I hope it's beautiful there, too. Grateful to have my dear friend Stephanie here with us again, being my co-host, and we're so grateful for our friend Mark Red. We'll be hearing from him in just a second. But before we do, I um, want to share another principle of doctrinal purity. Um, last time, we talked about clarity. This time, we get to talk a little bit about accuracy. Um, principle number eight, which says, class instruction should communicate only accurate and reliable information to inform and strengthen God's children and to protect the integrity of the Lord's church. Um, I think that this principle is kind of a fun one on being accurate. Um, I think sometimes we get into quotes or saying things that like, I remember somebody said something along the lines of this. Well, the greatest way to remain accurate is to quote from the living prophets or those that have been validated by a church curriculum and to read the quote exactly as it says. It helps us to stay very, very accurate. And so we appreciate that principle. And uh, I know that all of us could be a little bit more accurate. And so hopefully this will be a great reminder for us. Well, Brother Red, what week are you going to take us to this time? We are going to teach Timothy, both Timothys, Titus and Philemon. Um, although we'll, we'll probably focus most of our time in, in Timothy, that's what the curriculum does. Um, but all of it's good. Oh, this is, this is gold right here. Um, I'll make sure and be really speculative and quote my favorite general authority. I heard elder, I heard, uh, yeah. often, um, I heard he is a famous, famous man. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. I hear that one all the time. So, um, all right. Well. I want to kind of preface what's been on my mind and, and how I wanted to take us through some things for this week. Um, I've been thinking a lot about, and just in conversations with my teachers and others, um, about how to help those youth in our classes and, and our wards that are struggling, um, especially those youth that are struggling with um, exercising faith, um, experiencing true conversion, even, even just struggles, identifying whether they're feeling the spirit at all. Um, and in, in thinking a lot about this and giving this a lot of thought and prayer, uh, I've, I've really zeroed in on some work from President Nelson in teaching in the Savior's way. Um, and so we're going to go there. Let's see, sharing my screen. Um, so everything, everything I'm going to show today is all from teaching in the Savior's way and the curriculum. And online, so I don't have a PowerPoint, um, but I hope that that shows teachers just how readily accessible these things are. Um, so here's here's what President Nelson said, and he's quoted in, in teaching in the Savior's way. Um, Stephanie, would you be willing to uh, read this for us, and uh, you know try try not to add any words or take away any words so that we can be accurate. <laughs> Uh, President Russell M. Nelson has taught that the home should be the center of gospel learning. The teaching that happens at church or in seminary is valuable and needed, but it's meant to support the teaching that happens at home. The main setting and the best setting for gospel learning for both ourselves and our families is the home. But that doesn't mean that good gospel learning happens automatically at home. It takes conscientious effort. President Nelson has suggested that you might need to transform or remodel your home, not necessarily by tearing down, tearing down walls or adding new flooring, but perhaps by evaluating the overall spirit in your home, including your contribution to that spirit. Okay. So I, I've often seen this as, as a really common missing ingredient uh, for those of our students that are struggling. So my, my question is, um, you know, both of you as experienced teachers, what, what role does seminary have in good gospel learning taking place in the home? Well, I, I honestly love how they bounce off of each other. Um, I love it when the youth come to class and say, Brother Goss, in our family yesterday, we were studying this verse and we were kind of thinking it meant this. What are your thoughts on that? Or Brother mm -hmm. Goss, you know, we... Uh, we had this great activity and it showed us this principle and they get to just supplement what we've already, what we're talking about with some great family home scripture study. But on the other, other side, I've also had parents that have said, 
thank you for teaching things that the youth come home and then they share it in our family scripture study and give us different angles. And so it's just fun that they're working together, not necessarily that one trumps the other, uh, but that they were supporting one another, especially we're supporting the home, of course. Um, but it's just fun when that unity takes place between the two and then Sunday school as well, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I agree with you. Those are sweet moments. Um, and, and it's interesting. You can tell which, which students are are having that experience in the home and which ones, which ones aren't typically. Um, Stephanie, anything you would add to that? Um, I just make it a, a habit to, if they're not reading at home and they say that, I'm like, maybe you can be the one that starts this to encourage them to maybe change that home learning. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. yeah I love um, Elder Godoy's talk about you can avoid being the weak link in your generations, right? Mm -hmm. It's totally up to the individual to decide what cycles they will break and what good cycles they'll implement. Um, and I think we can do a lot. And so what I want to show today um, are some simple ways in the curriculum for this week uh, that we can that we can really promote home-centered gospel learning through seminary. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of great things that the text itself lends to, and we'll, we'll get there a little later. Um, but the curriculum does a great job of setting us up for success as teachers in helping our students take the take class into the home and, and strengthen that. And so um, I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show a couple places in the curriculum where we can really get the most bang for our buck, I think. Um, and then I want to ask you guys uh, what, what you've done and what you've seen done that have also encouraged effective um, home center gospel study. Uh, so, so here are some, here are some ideas uh, that I think are really helpful. Um, if there are any teachers that aren't looking at the overview for the week, um, can I just invite you to utilize this? Uh, this is so good. Um, you know, each lesson has a little summary. And one of those things in every one is a student preparation item. Um, so, Brandon, would you read this first one for us that I have highlighted in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1? Invite students to consider the following question and to come to class prepared to share their ideas. How have Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ blessed you or your family through a bishop or branch president? Okay. Now, already this is a this is encouraging home center gospel study for the individual, right? Mm -hmm. How might we modify this if we felt like we needed to really encourage maybe a little bit more family home centered gospel study? What could we do with this idea? Do you think? I could text or contact the parents and ask them to text me ideas. And share those with the class. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We have great mechanisms to do that. Um, you know, we can send out a mass text through WISE. Um, I don't know if, if there's any teachers that have set up a group me uh, with just parents of seminary. Um, so lots of tools to be able to do that. I like that. Um, one thought I had on this is, I mean, why don't you have this this conversation just as a family in general? You know, yeah. what? What has been your experience? You know, who's been a bishop that uh, has really blessed your lives as a family? Um, you know, if, if I were to have that conversation with my parents when I was a junior, senior in high school, um, we know the guy. Uh, it's uh, Jeff Carney. Okay, he's in, he's still in the combine stake to this day. So all you teachers that teach in the combine stake and know Jeff, like Jeff changed my life, um, and he helped me come to the Savior. So. Uh, there could be great things there. Uh, we've got another one. Um, I, I look at this one, right? You're, so you're inviting students to think about this question. If someone were to follow you around for a week, what evidence would they see that you are striving to follow Jesus Christ? Um, Stephanie, you're smiling. What, do you, what, what thought went through your head? I don't know. I just think we, we so often talk about faith is, is action. And so I know the students that this will hit the students well, and they're going to like that. But what a great way to talk in your family again. Yeah. About it would take take a bit of courage to maybe ask your parents or siblings this question. Yeah. <laughs> right. OK. About uh, yourself. What have you noticed about me? That would be a hard question. Yeah. Right. You know, it's interesting. You say that. So so our bishop, when he conducts tithing declaration, he asks the kids in the family, how do you know that your parents love Jesus? Mm -hmm. Right. And I love that. And I think it's, 
you know, to have the courage to, to solicit that kind of feedback, what a great conversation that could lead to. So the, these overview ideas, they're full of great things, quotes that you could discuss, um, you know, different, um, different ways in which you could collectively boost your, your family study and kind of do an inventory of, Hey, how are we doing? Um, and like I said, these particular blocks, they, they really lend themselves to encouraging home-centered gospel learning. Um, let me show another example. Okay. Um, let's see this first lesson. So this is from, uh, just the Monday lesson, first Timothy three and Titus one talking about bishops again. And, you know, similarly, Let's, let's say they had that conversation about a bishop who had really blessed themselves before they even came to class. Um, and then at the end of this lesson, there's a suggestion um, to write a brief letter or an email or text that bishop to thank them, to point out ways in which they've been an example of the Savior. Um, you know, pointing out his Christ-like attributes. Uh, and obviously, you know, if there are things you need to discuss with him that you haven't reached out to him about, what a time to be able to reach out to him. Um, any thoughts as to how this could also turn into a family activity, something you could encourage or invite students to do? Yeah, instead of doing it individually, just to uh, invite them as a family to write that letter and to think of ways that they could support and love and show gratitude to their bishop. Pretty simple yeah. change, but it helps support the family. Yeah. Mike, Mark, and I think all these things were, are going to be need to done, be done a week ahead of time with parents to give them some time to do this. Yeah. So, so Stephanie, as a teacher, how could you, I don't know, how could you use your time effectively to be able to do that and to be proactive a week in advance? Cause I agree with you. I think it will take a little extra foresight. So how would you do it if you were going to, to plan these in? I can think of two ways. I'd either again, contact each parent through wise in a kind of a mass email or I might give students like a three by five card and say, right on top of this, ask my family about this and bring it back. Yeah. yeah I think that's great. You know, I have a, um, I have an, an awesome teacher, the rifle stake that they send out just a weekly, here's what we're going to be discussing in class email. And, uh, and it, it, it's in advance. It's a great opportunity to do things like this. Um, it's also a great chance, you know, if there are controversial or challenging topics that are going to be brought up in seminary that we kind of gives the parents a heads up, hopefully prepares them and hopefully ideally prepares them to have those conversations in the home as well. So um, I think if, if we were to get into a routine of doing that and this just became part of our practice, uh, I think it could really go a long way. Mm -hmm. um, let me show one more simple thing. Uh, that I think we could do to to encourage this home study uh, type of type of support from seminary. Um, I love that in this is in the lesson for First Timothy four, um, where he's talking about be thou an example of the believers. Um, this this particular lesson is full of great videos. <laughs> um, I mean, there's there's one right here in the main lesson, and if you scroll down to the bottom, there's like four others that show just how people are being examples um there's a family in our ward that the way that they do come follow me is they just have a family group chat and whenever they find a quote or something inspiring that they're finding in their own personal come follow me study they put it in their family group chat um and one thing that they'll do i mean they share lots of memes um, sometimes that are on point and sometimes that aren't um, but they'll also show videos that they've come across for that week. And it just gives each family member a little lift. You know, it's a family member, a family that has teenagers and young adults alike. And so they're contributing from different places as well. And it's, it's one way where they're all kind of brought together and they're just sharing these things that they find And videos are a great way. You know, when someone sends a good video, you don't not watch it. Right. <laughs> I mean, that's just offensive. Um, and so, uh, again, just simple mechanisms that we can encourage and videos are easier, easy to share with your family. Um, you know, maybe your family's not doing come follow me. Um, and this is something that can get the conversation going a little bit, because like I said, it's such an easy thing uh, to share with people. Um, so 
that's a little bit of what I would encourage teachers to do with this week. And I want to show just one example of how the text of what, what we're actually studying in Timothy and Titus and Philemon um, can really just add some emphasis to this home centeredness that we're trying to promote in gospel study. Um, so would you guys go to me or go, go to me, go with me to second uh, Timothy chapter three. This is just a wonderful chapter. So prophetic in nature. And I think so helpful. Um, just as a, as a quick side note, one, one thing that I like to use in my study, I know some people have talked about uh, using different translations of the Bible and, um, you know, for those who don't know, the King James Version is like a, a translation of a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. <laughs> um, I love the King James, King James Version. Version. I teach from it. I use it. Um, I love the poeticness of it. But when I need some clarity, um, I, use, I use some other translations. And there's a really good one out. I'm not getting paid for this advertisement. Um, or that'd be really cool, Brother Waymond. Um, I love this one. This is, it's a translation specific for Latter-day Saints. And um, so not only is it, is it a translation of earlier manuscripts, right? We don't have any extant copies of biblical manuscripts, um, but these are much older and much likely much closer to the original. And then it's translated in a way where there's lots of kind of LDS specific footnotes. So I highly recommend it. And in fact, so if you guys are in 2 Timothy 3, I want to read the first five verses from this translation. Um, where it just kind of sets the stage, right? There's a big problem in our day, or perhaps many problems, and uh, and he's going to offer us a solution to these problems in a little bit. Um, so here he goes, Second uh, Timothy three. He says, "But know this, that difficult times will come in the last days, for people will be self-centered, lovers of money, boasters, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy." unloving, unbending, slanderers, without self-control, vicious, opposed to what is good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, loving pleasure rather than loving God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid such people. Um, unfortunately, that's an all too relevant description of the worst parts of our society today. Um, and so, again, just with this theme of, of home-centered gospel, and I just think it's so interesting what Paul's solution is that he gives to Timothy. Um, Stephanie, would you be willing to read verses 14 to 17 for us? What's the solution? And more importantly, why is it the solution? Did you say 14 to 17? <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Okay. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Jesus, Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So you guys, why, why are scriptures <laughs> and, uh, and, and study of them? Why are they the solution to all of these, these problems and these issues that, that we're facing in the last days? Keeps us grounded in truth. I mean, it's hard to fall off the path when you're holding on to the iron rod. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I totally agree. I love this line where it says that they're able to make us wise into salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And the way that translates is, the scriptures are able to make us wise when we look at them through the lens of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. As President Nelson has taught us over and over again, I am certain that the best place, the most ideal place for that to happen is in a home. And as teachers, we can do so much to encourage and to facilitate and to testify in a way that helps our students take that learning into the home, um, both on an individual and on a family basis. Um, I know the Savior He's the savior of individuals, but he's the savior of families. And may we remember that as we uh, as we continually and consistently uh, do what we can to be a home-centered, church-supported program like the prophet and essentially the savior has asked us to. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Thanks, Mark. Awesome. I think President Nelson would say, thanks, Mark. Thanks for pointing <laughs> him back to the home and helping us be very home-centered in our study and our worship. And what fun opportunities, right, as we're talking to Bishop Titus and talking about Bishop Titus to bring in the discussion on bishops and families. And it might even be fun to bring in a bishop. You know, if possible, we don't want to overwhelm them with more that they already have to do, but just to bring <clears> in a bishop and have them talk about his duties and roles and how it's blessed his own home and stuff. So. Absolutely. And if, and again, like Stephanie said, if we plan it and we plan it ahead of time, man, there's some great possibilities that we can bring in that we can make happen. So. Very good. Stephanie, you have any final words? No, thank you. I'm, I'm excited to encourage par- uh, students to be that catalyst in their family if they're not doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Amen to that. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Stephanie. We hope everybody has a wonderful week of teaching. And uh, enjoy these this fall weather. Take care. Bye. Okay. Thanks. Thanks.